humans are complex beings. We come from a series of hyper-specific strains and adaptations that we call human. But it took millions of years to create these designer bodies best suited for our environment. And it all came down to the smallest, simplest block of life, cells. Hi, my name is Kushi, and over the course of this program, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Jyoti Rulo and Dr. Jihua Hao on a project studying the stability of evolving populations in various heterogeneous environments and its implications for the early evolution of single-celled organisms. Before the first Homo sapien, before the dinosaurs, and before fish walked onto this earth and made us pay taxes, there was a time called the Precambrian period, spanning 4.6 billion to 541 million years ago. It is during this period, around 4 to 3.5 billion years, that we believe the first forms of life appeared, the first cells. It is theorized that these microbial communities may have originated in hot springs or around marine hydrothermal vents, where environmental conditions such as temperature and pH change over time and across space. So our question is, do these environmental changes support or prevent the first simple cells from evolving into something more complex? And if these fluctuations help evolution, how and where could these first cells have evolved to their volatile biosphere? Our project simulates dynamic early Earth conditions in a Python model by a series of environmental parameters. To begin the design of our experimental model, we set a pool of cells in a closed compartment, resembling a hydrothermal vent or hot spring, and design a range of factors, including food accessibility, energy, growth, and division factors. We establish P, the environmental parameter, as the independent parameter that fluctuates and can be used to represent anything from pH to temperature or salinity. To seek an answer to our question, we impose this model on two populations of single cells to examine their response in one population com compared to the other. In one population, the cells can adapt to the environmental parameter and in the other, they cannot. One, one option is they both, both populations evolve sorry, both populations survive, two, one outcompetes the other, or three, both run extinct. Our aim is to check whether evolution is more favored to appear under certain environmental conditions and identify these factors. Now that we have our aim, we may establish our two hypotheses. One, faster and more ample p variations don't favor evolution, and two, more compartments will favor evolution where evolved cells can migrate and survive in compartments that are better suited for them. Operating in Python, we established a base code with a simple output and ran this to understand the effect of the factors one by one and in pairs on how a steady state system would react. Here, we can see variation of food input when halved or doubled has limited impact on a population. This is key for later. In our second stage of research, we began to build upon this model to create more realistic environmental oscillation. This stage was crucial to our research as it allowed us to search for threshold values at which the code would break down, for example, if a population grew indefinitely, and where it would produce reliable and valid data for further analysis. During this, we observed different outputs even when running identical parameters. Spending a majority of the program in this stage allowed us to dabble with the parameter co combinations and study this unique phenomena of randomness. When you run a code without changing values or factors, you expect a program to produce the same result every time. However, population dynamics is a unique lens into chaos theory. A population may be repeatedly exposed to similar conditions, yet produce distinct adaptations each time. Thus, we have identified the conceptual design of this code and that we are in fact seeking the most probable outcome, the most exemplar conditions, which no matter how many times we run the code would continuously favor evolution. It is a probability study and a probability study calls for repetition. Now we know repetition is imbued in the standard experimental design of science. Here, we address the randomness of the output by adding iterations and loops. 
we embedded for loops that run upper and lower boundary values with steps in between, and each step reiterated 10 times. Seamlessly integrating these four loops reduced our workload by condensing mass data and generating a final average. This even allowed us to increase the number of time steps to run longer simulations, paralleling a cell experiencing long-term environmental changes to see if it could withstand and adapt to continuous environmental fluctuation. Thus, to conduct a thorough investigation, my team developed a systematic constraint by delegating three specialized groups of parameter studies. While my fellow research associates looked at life or death factor studies and a volume growth study, I conducted a food study focused on the following factors. FIR is the rate of food input into the compartment enclosing the cells. DF is the factor of food diffusion through the cell membranes, and the and the energy required to keep the cell alive is proportional to FUF, while the rate at which our environmental parameter P fluctuates is PO period. This allowed us to design specific environmental stresses and investigate how scarce or ab abundant nutrient availability may have impacted the metabolic growth rate of these cells and whether they infringe on the ability to adapt. The process of data production was long, with each run taking between 20 to 30 minutes to compile values. Feeding the large collated numerical files into a new code produced three population graphs and one system overview. The rate of environmental oscillation, PO period, was set from 20 to 500 oscillations, with 40 values taken in between at 10 iterations each. The first graph visualizes the overall growth of the culture within the compartment, adding both populations together as N2 plus N1. Since the graph fluctuates around an equilibrium, we need a more detailed perspective to observe parameter effects. <clears throat> Thus, our second and third graphs are critical. The second graph, N2 minus N1, gauges the response of one population against the other. The absolute difference between the two details a climbing population. On the right-hand side, the graph slowly oscillates, corresponding to a high period. This means that when environmental oscillation is longer, the cells have an easier time adapting to the surrounding environment. On the left-hand side of the graph, a shorter period means faster ecological fluctuation. As the graph scales lower in this region, we can assess that rapid variation in environments are unfavorable to evolution, as the cells have a harder time adapting to the changes, thus depleting more energy than the non-evolving cells. The final graph N2 on N1 plus 1 highlights the ratio of growth between populations, with a plus 1 on the denominator to ensure that there are no zeros. Since the graph demonstrates an upward trend as the period increases, we once more concur that evolution is continuously favored when a population is subject to gradual changes, allowing for the cells to generate a healthy functionality. This verifies hypothesis one, where we sought to observe that rapid variation of a closed environment does not support cell metamorphosis. A quick glance at other parameter analysis consistently mirrors the expected response of real cells. I identified that a high cell maintenance energy produces unfavorable conditions for evolution. Cell populations begin to dwindle when too much energy is diverted here. Making them inversely proportional, as you can see on the first graph middle. The rate of food input was independent of growth, signaling that after a certain value, an abundant nutrient supply cannot impact growth as, the, as there exists a maximum amount a cell can intake. This is shown due to the graph fluctuating around an equilibrium on the middle graph middle. Finally, the, food of, the factor of food diffusion demonstrates fixed behavior regardless of increase or decrease, holding little impact on cell growth rate. Overall, my food study illustrates a holistic impression of the effect of nutrients on primordial evolution. Over the course of the summer, or in my case, winter, being able to thoroughly affirm a hypothesis was an exciting result of the program. However, a good experiment always learns from its shortcomings by searching for improvements. Our experimental analysis could benefit 
from a further code enhancement in which we incorporate multiple for loops to study the effect of many varying factors in a single simulation. This would act as a more faithful microcosm of early, early life factors in a single simulation. The study could also benefit from repetition to maximize reliability for when we are able to run simulations even longer than my 30 minutes. As we draw closer to the conclusion of the program, we hope to examine the second hypothesis as an extension to our initial aim. However, I believe the aim of our experiment has been successfully satisfied, proving that certain environmental factors are more likely to cater for evolution compared to others that may deter. Ultimately, the study presents an excite exciting new material for future research to examine, and accumulating evidence could lead to solving the age-old question of how multicellular organisms came to inhabit this hearth, Earth, perhaps hinting at life beyond the bounds of our planet. Finally, I'd love to thank the audience for listening to my talk today and everyone at Blue Marble Space that made the Young Scientist program possible, my um, program advisors, uh, supervisors, and my fellow research associates. Thank you so much. Fantastic job, Cushy. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? You can ask them in the chat or raise your hands if you would like. I see Benji has a question we can start with. Yeah, a uh, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I guess one thing that I wanted to ask is um, when you were talking earlier about how you were trying to get at like an optimal situation for uh, the evolution of life, is it possible that that optimal civilization, that optimal situa situation would be something other than Earth? In other words, could this be used to maybe find some kind of super habitability that planets that are even more conducive to life than Earth uh, that could come out of the simulation? Um, thank you for that question. That's a that's a fantastic one. So I I believe that what we're trying to do here is uh, create a model based around hydrothermal vents and hot pools. So what we're taking into consideration here, luckily, is that there are many many volatile factors that are consistently changing. So I feel I I believe that it is possible that this model would be able to mirror conditions on another planet simply because we allow for the motion of so many variables to move and to explore the, the way that these factors affect a growing population. Now, the, the other hand of this is the fact that we are basing a growing population on the known model of a cell. We are expecting the cells to behave the way that we expect to see them on Earth. And that's simply because of the bias of our own view from our own planet. So while we may be able to recreate a simulation of um, perhaps, you know, Europa or a, a celestial body with ugh, water and those types of environments, what we may not be able to do is create a cell response that mirrors that. So specifically with this model, what we may be able to do is adapt that side of the the program and then we may be able to leave more room for a cell to adapt in a different way and that way we I, I think it's a good basis model for looking at life on other planets but the model would need to be tweaked halfway to be able to allow for that sort of growth I hope that answers your question yeah awesome thank you so much yeah very intriguing Sanjoy thank you and thank you Kushi for your wonderful presentation uh, my, my question has to do with kind of ground truth in the model. How are we sure that the mathematics that are implemented actually capture the real dynamics of biological populations? That's a perfect question and something that we consistently went over um, during this course. And the, the fact is that it may not be. Um, just within the bounds of these three months, we started to really hone in on what the code was doing in Python, and we made improvements along the way. And what this tells us that is that a scientific process is it pretty much never finished. We can consistently make improvements and um, adjust that adjust the way that this code is behaving. So um, 
what we observed is that a lot of the outputs that we were receiving were pretty faithful to documented research that we have available. And because this is what we're basing our code upon, we are hoping that the mathematics mirrors the, the actuality of what's happening. Um, and that being said, I think there's still always room for improvement, but I believe the code is a pretty decent estimation of, you know, like beginning to make this work, yeah. I think, I think it's fantastic you guys are working on that. Um, your presentation will be strengthened if you could overlap the data from your code with like real data obtained from the lab and show a correlation. Yes, yes, that would be great. I should remember that for next time.